I think the number one killer is fear. At the heart of every, like all these, all of the fighting and all of the discom uh, disconnection and also ineffective behaviors in relationships. Like, you know, behind criticism, for example, we showed how fear motivated that whole thing. You know, I'm gonna get really critical and angry with my partner. At the heart of it was fear. And maybe in response, your partner pulls back, shuts down, leaves you, you know, the withdrawing type. That also comes from fear. If you boil it back down, usually at the heart of that is a fear of getting it wrong, fear of continuing to talk and making things worse, fear. It's just always, it's always fear, you know, and even things like affairs, like real relationship killers are based in fear and an inability to cope with fear. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Purple Stars podcast. I'm Sarah, your host, and you are in for a real treat today. We have a renowned couples therapist on the show. He is the creator of several amazing programs on how to create better relationships. And let me tell you in advance, he is so authentic. He has such a calming energy, and also he makes the world a better place. And he's going to make our Purple Stars world today a, a little better place. Please welcome Trevor Hansen. Thanks for having me. We're so excited because love is such a big part of our podcast, whether it's with our furry companions, our partners, our friends, love for ourselves. So who better to interview than someone who's world is around all of that, especially in their expertise. So uh, I wanted to tell you, you are hosting the podcast, The Art of Healing. And I recently listened to your solo episode called Getting Real and Vulnerable About My Story. I was so moved by it. And uh, so I always listen to one or two interviews before I interview someone. And yeah. I'm so happy I picked that one because I felt I really got to know you in a pretty deep way. And you even yeah. said on the podcast, you shared things that you haven't shared with even a few friends before. Mm -hmm. And I would love to know, especially for our audience, how did you transition from someone that was very insecure and experienced broken relationship to someone who is happy and in a happy marriage and also is impacting and not just um, your own world, but worldwide couples to have more fulfilled relationships? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> that's a big question. A lot of things <laughs> There's a lot of things that went into that, honestly. So it's, uh, and by the way, I'm impressed that you listen to that episode. It's like three hours long. It's like the longest episode I've ever done in my life. And so it's <laughs> really good. Making, <laughs> making it through. Um, but yeah, I feel like that, that transition, it happens over time at different periods. I feel like, I feel like there was in the beginning, it was all about just recognizing that, you know, it kind of has a name, you know, and we kind of can call that anxious attachment where you're feeling like a bit anxious that others are going to leave you and you don't quite feel good enough. And you have a lot of fear of rejection and maybe, it, you know, and, and other people deal with it too. And the fact that it has a name and that other people deal with it and they actually do not just deal with it, meaning like suffer from it, but they, they deal with it, like work through it. That's a bit of a hopeful place to start. And I think that's, that's like where it all started for me is realizing like, Oh, this is, this is actually a thing people work on and they can start feeling better. Like that's awesome. And, um, really, I mean, I think I, well, I, in a way was kind of forced into some therapy just by like the circumstances of life. Like it got really, really hard all of a sudden and on the tail end of a pretty, pretty toxic relationship. Um, and through that process, it went from trying to fix that relationship to staying on board with my therapist and going, no, I just want to work on me now. And 
I there's there's so many things that make that shift happen. Part of it's like healing the inner child, unlocking and understanding kind of where your wounding comes from. Like, why do I feel so anxious about losing others or not being enough or being rejected? Maybe looking at other times, you know, for me, adolescence was a hard time when it, there was a lot of rejection there. It looks like being able to connect with things that you believe in from like an existential perspective, like God and spirituality and trying to understand your own worth and your own value from a bigger viewpoint. Um, there's, there's so many things that go into it. There's also learning how to have purpose and meaning outside of your relationships. Because, you know, if you're a bit anxiously attached, a bit insecure, you'll kind of put all of your happiness on the other person. And it's it's kind of a it's kind of a heavy weight for people to bear. It's like we're we're trying to keep ourselves happy, let alone like take on your entire purpose and meaning and happiness in life. And so that would that in in effect pushes others away. And so learning how to have my own purpose, my own sense of meaning, was also really huge. So there's there's like a ton of things. We can look at any of them specifically, but there's a whole lot of different pieces that go into going from secure or sorry, insecure, maybe anxious to a place of, you know, secure and sure of yourself and, and calm and kind of at peace in your internal world. I am so happy by with your answer. <laughs> because it is such a great bridge to my second question that I have, because I personally view a relationship, whether it's with ourselves, with our partner, kids, friends, whoever it is, as a journey that requires a lot of steps to be fulfilling. And you mentioned quite a lot of them already, you know, the inner work mm -hmm. and understanding your patterns, your triggers. Um, I also see like letting go of generational, you know, trauma and understanding yeah. the deeper root of our attachment styles, as you call, um, um, called it. And I really also love that you mentioned that having a purpose outside the relationship. I just recently published a, uh, an episode about friendships. And uh, I talked with my friend Stuart and we said it's so important to not expect the other person to be everything for us because it is so much pressure and it's so much weight. And I also think it's it's not good for the other person, but also for ourselves, because it's a little bit like throwing the anchor outside and it just drowns both of us at some point. Mm -hmm. And I think in order to have a healthy relationship rather than always being each other's crutch, I think it's good yeah. to, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are times we have to lean on one another, but I think the healthiest way, if I put it in the picture is walking side by side rather yeah. than like holding each other constantly and being each other's legs and arms and so mm -hmm. i'm so 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 happy you you mentioned that and i wonder what is a tip you have for people first to identify even if they are putting too much expectation on their partner and also if they do what helps them to you know, like draw it more within again, the purpose and saying, I can fill my own cup and my partner is basically the icing on the cake. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, I think some of those, you know, the, the anxiety or fear is kind of the, the big marker that says like, where is this coming from? Cause it's hard to say like, what's too much and what's, what's like, okay or expected it's hard for me to sit here and kind of make like if you you know if you text them every day that's too much or that's okay like it's hard to like almost delineate all mm -hmm. the behaviors and so i would almost go away from behavioral and go to a more internal place and try to observe like how you're feeling because if you look there then the behaviors start taking care of themselves like like maybe a problematic behavior is that like you criticize your partner a lot because you have a sensitivity to feeling rejected or abandoned. And when maybe something isn't perfect and they don't follow through in the right way, or, you know, you don't get that text that you expected, or maybe they don't say, I love you at the end of a phone call, or maybe they didn't, you know, 
praise you in front of this new group of people that they just introduced you to, like whatever it is, those can all be points of sensitivity where when that happens, you start to feel this internal fear, this internal anger, and you turn to criticism, right? That obviously is like a, is a problematic behavior because your pro partner's probably not going to like that. And most likely they're just going to pull away even further, leaving you feeling more abandoned and more fearful of rejection than before. It's like this vicious cycle. So if we go back to that little narrative that I just talked about, in that one example, we looked at criticism as a behavior. There's other behaviors too. You know, there's like really, and it kind of depends on the stage of the relationship, early dating, a lot of communication, like over communicating can be really overwhelming, but that might be how you're dealing with the emotion, right? And the emotion is where I want to focus. And if it's fear, then usually there's something there that says, okay, something's off here. If I'm driven in my relationships by fear, then maybe I have a part of me that needs to be healed, right? Um, it's, that, it's that spirit of fear versus love. And the love-based motivation is maybe what we're looking for. Love-based motivation sounds like, oh man, I would really love for my partner to have, you know, maybe hyped me up a little bit in front of this new group of people. And, and I really love them and I want them to do it because, because I love them and because it feels good to be loved by them in front of other people. And instead of criticizing them, maybe I can tell them, hey, just so you know, like when we introduce new people, like I do love it when you kind of talk about me, like it feels good, makes me feel included. It's like, well, that's a totally different, that's a totally different approach. So looking at your underlying kind of cadence, and here's the thing, to say like, if you feel a bit of fear at times, then you've got a problem. No, that's not it. That's not it. We're going to feel fear in our relationships. But if you feel like your general mode of operation is to feel really fearful of being rejected, pushed away, abandoned, um, you try to manage love through fear, which means you try to manage your partner you try to get what you want based on a fear, kind of a platform of, of fear-based motivations, then yeah, maybe that's a good place to go, oh, maybe I got some healing to do. I wonder what part of me is injured so that it believes that I'm going to be hurt or that believes I'm not good enough. That kind of underlying programming there that might need to be looked at. It's, it's so important to look at the underlying programs, because I always say it's a little bit like, um, otherwise we're only treating the symptom and not the cause. And it keeps mm. coming back. It might always look like come in different colors and different shapes and different situations. But I, I'm a big believer if we are like fear is basically indicating, hey, there's a wound that still needs healing and still needs some love. And yeah. It will, if we try to shut it out, it will come through the back door. It will come through the window. Like it will always be there and catch up with us. And what I personally think is a, um, a great first step for people when they have this anxiety to share that with the partner and say, hey, I noticed like I get so anxious and that's not an excuse for my behavior, but it is an explanation and I'm going to work on it. Like right now, I might not know how, but I want you to know it's, um, it's something that's underlying. So when you leave your socks there or you come 10 minutes late or you don't thank me for, you know, having cooked a really nice meal, it's actually not that particular situation, but something that's much deeper. And I think mm -hmm. just, just explaining that is already creating a safe place for healing and also mutual understanding. Right. Well, and it, and it also, it increases ownership. Like you're taking mm -hmm. responsibility for your emotional response and your behavior at that point. And I think that's maybe what you were saying where you're like, it's not an excuse. It's, it's really quite, a, frankly, the opposite. It's, yeah, maybe I react big when you're late, just so you know, it's something I'm working on. It comes from this place where, you know, people didn't show up for me in my life. And if, and if you don't show up for me, that's devastating because I love you and that would hurt. And it's not. And so you got to deal with me getting explosive. No, no. The end of that sentence is, and so... I ask for grace, but I also know that like, I need to do better and I need mm -hmm. to continue to work on this and heal this. Uh, if you can be patient with me while I figure it out, that'd be amazing. 
And if it's too much, I totally understand, but like, I'm, I'm working on it here, right? That's the kind of like real ownership. And that way it's not your past. The wounds that you carry are not excuses, but they are, they're, you know, they, they're just a, a piece that unlocks kind of the greater picture of how you can heal. If you got to understand what you've what you're, what you're mm-hmm. working with, what kind of wound you've got. You know, I make the analogy: Can you imagine a doctor or a surgeon who tries to do surgery, but he's too afraid to look at the wound that he closes his eyes the whole time? Mm-hmm. Man, he would just do way more damage than he than he does good. He'd, he'd cut you up in all the wrong places, and and so being able to look at our wounds, even though they're pretty scary sometimes, maybe that looks like facing the reality that you know. Maybe mom, who's super loving and bubbly and fun, really actually wasn't emotionally there for you. Mm-hmm. And it feels weird to say that. It feels contradictory because you love mom, you care about her, but, and it feels like it's wrong to say that kind of a thing. That's like looking at the wound and saying, it's painful to look at that and say, mom's loving and bubbly and amazing, but she really wasn't there for me emotionally. She was bubbly and loving towards everybody else. And I was kind of put on the shelf, like, oh, that's hard to look at. But that's where the healing starts is looking at those kinds of things to understand, you know, why do I feel this fear that others aren't going to be there for me, that others are going to reject me? Well, maybe it's because mom wasn't quite there for you. Mm. It reminds me of something you said in your podcast episode I listened to, and it um, it was in a different context, but I think it's very applicable for this as well. You said, yeah. when you escape the experience, you escape the lessons. Mm. And I think that's really what it is in that sense. Like if you escape facing your fears Mm -hmm. and the wounds, you escape the lessons and also the freedom. I think that's another really, really big thing because otherwise we are always a slave, you know, of our patterns and of our wounds. And also I think it feels like being just on the passenger seat in our own life. Yeah. 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 And you know, what's it's kind of hard because some people are comfortable there. Some people mm-hmm. are comfortable, like not having that freedom because it feels like, man, if I have freedom, if I can actually make choices, if I can take responsibility for my actions, if I can heal all of this, then, then what? Like, what does that even mean for me? I've never experienced mm-hmm. life like that. And it can be, it can be really, it can be really terrifying to even think about doing that healing. But you're right. As soon as we you know, are willing to face the hard parts of our lives, our history, do our healing, you know, go through the pain, we wind up learning so much. We also have so much freedom. But and one thing that we haven't mentioned is that when you when you have a life where you face your obstacles, and you learn from them, you also have a life of purpose. And a lot of people have purposeless lives. And I believe that at the heart of depression is a lack of purpose. If you don't know why you're here, if you have no meaning in your life, then you're going to feel super depressed. It's like, why the heck are you here? You're just going to feel like a body that kind of, you know, moves from one place to another, but you're not going to feel like a, like a complete soul that has a mission and a purpose. And if you avoid your pain, you also avoid purpose because purpose always comes with pain and struggle every bit of it any mm-hmm. and anytime you find purpose you will also find pain and struggle and so if you try to avoid your pain you're also going to avoid your purpose and therefore avoid happiness and this is kind of getting way too big and existential but in another word for purpose is kind of like the meaning of your life and so if mm-hmm. you avoid pain you avoid the meaning behind your life it's I totally agree and I'm so happy you brought that up because I do I do think um pain like purpose includes the pain and you know like or transforming the pain into purpose and it's um I personally think if we and I also shared that in another episode if if we are escaping we're constantly running away from our own home and then we can never feel safe. Mm-hmm. And the second when we turn around, meaning when we are willing to face, that's when we take the steps towards our home. 
the home within. Mm. And that's when we heal, when we are safe. That's when we can connect. Because we can't connect yeah. if we're just running on the sidewalk and just saying hi, and then you're already gone. Like it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't work, work that way. Right, right. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, our internal world, as it becomes healed, as it becomes in order, then it feels safe to be in there. It's like, I'm okay being mm -hmm. inside of me. I'm okay oh, yeah. being here. And when we don't feel that way, we'll do things like try to get it from others. It's like, I don't feel safe in me. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to pursue other people or pursue addictions, things that make me feel good, make me feel better, or whatever else can help distract from that internal world. I like that idea that as the internal world becomes safe, it becomes a true home. Mm -hmm. And my heart just really open with how you put it in your own words. It reminds me of a situation when I was in my 20s. I had a, I had a big fear of people leaving me, yeah. um, but also like dying, leaving me. And, mm -hmm. and then they, then there came a point I was like, okay, how can I heal it within myself? Because eventually people will pass on, like, even if they yeah. love me, they die. And it made me realize in the little things, I can start healing it by showing up for myself. Because if I don't leave myself, mm. then the fear of someone else leaving me gets smaller. I'm not saying it completely disappears. But when I show up for myself, I know whatever life throws at me and whatever the reaction of other people are, I have me. And yeah. that's, and, and, and that's can be in, in the little things, you know, showing up for my meditation or showing up for my workout or giving myself the rest that I need, like any kind of way could, can be showing up smaller and bigger things. And that was a big, big, big change for me. Plus also marrying that with knowing I always have God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a huge thing for me as well was this idea that says like, no matter what happens, I believe that there's a bigger plan that I'm not necessarily fully clued in on. I don't know it, but I'm totally in on it, meaning I'm part of the plan and there's a mm -hmm. plan for me that's bigger. And it, it's kind of almost like this little secret when you start to realize that like, you know, God's an a loving being that's not just arbitrarily slapping us around and making us go through hard things just for the fun of it, but mm -hmm. because there's some sort of lesson there and there's a purpose there and that like everything is meant for our good. That's something I, I try to live by and, and that it's actually designed by an intelligent mind to, mm -hmm. to be that way. It's like, there's so much peace in that. No matter what happens, you're okay when you start to believe those things. My, my deepest belief is that life is my friend. And that doesn't mean that it's always joyful, but it means that life is here for me. Um, life gives me the tools when things get hard, um, sends me the right books, the right podcasts, the right people when, you know, along the way to, for me to, go along with the journey. And yeah. I also think it's, it's not so important to believe necessarily in God, as much as I believe in it, but I have a lot of friends that believe in something else. I think it's right. just important to believe in something Right. that is higher than us, whatever people call it, but because yeah. it gives us comfort. And also mm -hmm. it takes away the pressure that we have to figure out everything, you know, by ourselves. It's like, okay. Um, and as you said, like, there's a bigger plan and we don't know it. Like right. when I, when I notice that I like have the, like, to tight my hands and I, you know, like try to figure things out. Like I do meditations and I open my hands and then I place one hand on my heart and the other one on my head. And I say mm -hmm. the one with my head, I said, even if I don't understand, then I put once more the heart on hand on my heart saying, I trust with my heart. And it's mm -hmm. like, for me, it's such a big thing because 
it makes life much easier. And I always think of a birthday. No one gets anxious because they don't know what's like, what gift is wrapped, you know? <laughs> it's right. like, I think we should like treat life a little bit more like birthdays. And I'm like, oh, I don't know it. This is exciting. And associate something positive with it rather than, oh my yeah. God, what could it be? I love that idea. It's like treat life like a birthday. Like, yeah. sure, what's going to happen? I'm excited to see. Absolutely. And one thing I really would love to, to know from you because you, we, we have mentioned already some quite important steps to be fulfilled in the relationship with ourselves and also then obviously with others. What do you think is the number one superpower of happy couples? And also, what is the number one relationship killer? Yeah. Hmm. Well, maybe I'll start with the, the killer first so I can end on a positive note here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and because I feel like it makes sense with what we're talking about. Um, I think the number one killer is fear at the heart of every, like all these, all of the fighting and all of the dis uh, disconnection and also ineffective behaviors in relationships. Like, you know, behind criticism, for example, we showed how fear motivated that whole thing. You know, I'm going to get really critical and angry with my partner at the heart of it was fear. And maybe in response, your partner pulls back, shuts down, leaves you, you know, the withdrawing type. That also comes from fear. If you boil it back down, usually at the heart of that is a fear of getting it wrong, fear of continuing to talk and making things worse, fear. It's just always, it's always fear, you know? And even things like affairs, like real relationship killers, are based in fear and mm -hmm. an inability to cope with fear. I'm going to cope outside of the relationship because I've got something that's within me that is fearful, fearful that I can't find love, fearful that um, my partner's not going to be able to be there for me. You know, there's so much, so much of what kills relationships is fear, or another word is insecurity. We could call it either way. Um, but then kind of some of the antidote to that is it's a mix of things. There's the way, you know, and I don't want this to get mixed up because I'm going to talk about communication here for a second and communication. The reason people always say when they come in to like, see me, they'll be like, we want to work on communication. And I think people are, are insightful. They know what they need and everybody says we need communication. And so I talk about, you know, healthy communication being a superpower of couples, but I'm not saying learn a bunch of skills and you're going to get better because you have to be able to use those skills. And it's the, it's the impact of healthy communication. That's really the superpower. Mm -hmm. And what healthy communication actually means is being vulnerable, being able to connect with that understanding of your fear. Hey, I'm noticing that I want to withdraw I want to pull away from you right now because things are getting hard, but I don't, but I truly don't want to do that. I actually want to be close to you. I long to be close, but I'm so afraid that if we keep talking, that we're just going to hurt each other. Whoa, you just jumped right out of the negative cycle, that spiral that couples just get caught in where you start defending and defending and defending and pulling away and criticizing all the, the crazy moves. But that, that ability to communicate in love and vulnerability in honesty that's the superpower and i guess in this truncated version we'll call that healthy communication but it's much bigger than just the concept of communication it's like everything i've been saying that vulnerability that honesty that clarity the love-based communication around why you do what you do and what you long for in the relationship mm. this is so good it's so, so, so good. I see communication as a, a bridge we build from heart to heart. And yeah. very often arguments when they are driven by fear, it's also head to head. And it's like past to past. And it's not a mm -hmm. connection from the now to now, you know, like it's, it just, 
when our communication is driven by fear, like we built the walls, there is no bridge. And, and what do you think is the first step for people to be able to create a safe space where they then feel comfortable enough? I'm not saying super excited, but comfortable enough to share their needs and to voice their fears and to build this bridge and trust. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially kind of the question is like, how do you make your, your, how do you help your partner feel safe enough to Mm -hmm. move into that vulnerability? Well, I think, I think you have to take, you have to take responsibility for creating that space. And it's hard because there's, there's the question of, fairness like what's equitable like should i be the one to go first in creating safety like who knows like it's almost i feel like we get too caught up on this question of like well it's not fair that i'm going first or it's not fair that i'm i'm the one who's leading that out fair or not is it effective and is it going to work that's the real question i want to ask And if it's effective and it's going to work, then do it, whether you feel like it's fair or not. And so going first looks like being the first one to recognize how you rob the relationship of safety at different times. And usually you'll rob it in one of these ways. You either get critical, pointing out what your partner is doing wrong, rather than asking for what you need and kind of framing it within a positive request rather than a criticism. Or you're getting defensive, you're putting yourself on the PR campaign, invalidating your partner's feelings, um, just kind of arguing your point rather than slowing down and giving space for them to actually be heard when they say something. Instead of you just jumping in and saying, well, no, because it's this way. It's like, well, how about you just slow down and actually acknowledge like, what they're what they're saying? Or shutting down and withdrawing is another way of really robbing a relationship of safety. And and we kind of talked about maybe the antidote to that, which is stay present, be vulnerable. Maybe even just mention that you're feeling that tendency, but you're wanting to do something different. And then, you know, another one is kind of the, and we're talking really about Gottman type research here. We're talking about criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and then contempt. And contempt is where we start to voice um, kind of this air of I'm better than you kind of, mm-hmm. kind of thing. And it, it oftentimes comes from a place of feeling like deeply hurt to the point where we feel like we have to hit them back. We have to strike back. And so kind of the antidote to that is being able to acknowledge the hurt and being honest about the hurt rather than trying to just to hurt them back. And so those are the shifts that you can make. And most people have one of those moves that they do more than others. And it's not always this way because it's actually kind of reversed in my own relationship. It's usually the women tend to be a little bit more on the criticism and judgment side of things. And men tend to be on the withdraw and shut down side of things. And so looking at, if you're listening, I would say, look at your own self and say, how do I cope with fear, distress? When I feel hurt, when I feel like I have a need, how do I cope with that in a way that robs safety in the relationship? Do I criticize, defend, shut down, or get contemptuous? Hmm. Okay. If I can change that, if I can find a new strategy, because all they are are strategies. You know, Mm -hmm. criticism is one way of trying. Shutting down is one way of doing it, or defending is one way of doing it. They're all just, and that's the best part, is that you can just find a new strategy. You're not married to it. It's not It's not just part of you. Like you can do something different. And so as you do something different, you can then create safety for your partner. And the more safe they feel, this is the coolest part of it. You're, you're not going to control your partner. You're not going to manipulate your partner, but you can influence them. And mm-hmm. when you start acting safe, it creates more safety for them. And therefore, they start to respond in more safe ways. They're less likely to withdraw and shut down if you quit criticizing them and start actually asking for what you need in a in a positively framed and vulnerable way. And you know they're going to stop criticizing you if you stop pulling back and withdrawing and leaving them in the dust. It's like 
look at that. You're going to, you're going to influence that. And is it, is it like a magic recipe where if you do the right thing, they'll immediately start doing the right thing? No, it can take some time. They might not even trust it yet. They're like, what is happening? Where's, where's my partner? Like, who, who, did, who replaced you? Like, I can't trust this yet, right? There's maybe a part of them that can't can't totally lean in. But that's a good place to start. I will say one more thing, and this is a long answer, but if you're always the one going first and you're continually doing your work, that might be a problem. You need to kind of look at that and understand, mm-hmm. okay, are there some boundaries that I need to hold? Are there some expectations that I need to stick to in this relationship when it comes to the reciprocity where we're both choosing to lean into safety. Um, Because if you're always going first and you're always providing the safety only, um, that's not a very sustainable way to be in a relationship. This is such a big topic. Um, We could have like, two, three, four, five hours, episodes, multiple of them. Yeah. Could you could you tell our audience, please, because you have so many great programs and freebies, if they want to yeah. explore more about healthy communication and understanding their patterns and also how to create a safe place within the relationship, like what would be a great way to start Yeah. So a great way to start this would just be, I always tell people there's so much information that's free. Um, You go to my Instagram, for example, there's like tons of stuff that's already Mm -hmm. free that'll help you start to kind of just get in that mindset, start to adopt new ways of thinking. Um, And then from there, I've got some free uh, workshops that I always host, they kind of rotate through. So, you know, they'll be available for a time and then, then they won't after, but I've got a lot of those that are consistently up. If you follow my posts, if you read the captions, you're going to see opportunities to jump into things for free. And there's Mm -hmm. also some paid ones that I offer, but you know, maybe going straight into therapy isn't viable for you. Like maybe it's not going to work. Maybe your partner's not down to go with you. Maybe uh, you just don't have access to it where you live. Uh, But starting with some sort of education from a from a highly informed source, somebody who who has some experiences some credentials, you know, myself, I have a master's in marriage and family therapy, and I'm a licensed therapist. Um, You know, that as a baseline, is a good place to start from. And not to say others like coaches and things can't be helpful because they can. Um, but I would say start with start with what's free. Start consuming some of mm-hmm. that information. You probably already are if you're listening to this particular podcast. But um, I've got specific workshops that really outline the healthy communication workshop. You know, we mentioned that before we started talking here, uh, that really outline exactly how to navigate those moments and really step by step how to implement the antidote to defensiveness, criticism, stonewalling, and so on. Really just simply spelling it out. Like people are like, I just want you to give me the answers. I'm like, okay, I can give you the answers. Mm -hmm. I will make sure we put everything in the show notes and not just um, the the communication workshops you just mentioned. I also really want to make sure people get the link to the 19 conversations closer challenge because it sounds awesome like i really like it's for everyone please make sure and uh what you just said like get first all the free resources um educate yourself raise your awareness shows again what a good heart you have and that you're in your purpose and you're not a sales machine like i think it's just it's another good reflection that you're like yeah really walking your path yeah, yeah. And ni- ni- 19 conversations closer is a paid offer, but it's a it's not it's not a very expensive one. That's kind mm-hmm. of like the uh, least expensive. And it's really just 19 different conversations, meaning each conversation is full of different questions that are designed to help you explore each other and go deeper in an emotional place in your relationship to experience closeness and connection. Because I believe really the recipe for connection is 
emotional exploration with emotional attunement. And exploration is going into new places and it's an emotional experience. And then the attunement is where you're tuning in with one another and being aware of the other one's experience and feeling those things together. And so that's kind of why I created that particular challenge. I'm definitely going to get that challenge because um, I saw all the different topics. It's it's just so wide. It covers every single like faith, sexuality and um, yeah. trust and like everything. And I was like, wow, like this is, I think every couple should get that. And I think even people that are single should get it because there are questions that you might want to ask someone when you start dating them to actually quicker mm -hmm. find out, are we a match or are we not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I love that. Trevor, um, as you know, our podcast is full of animal lovers. And I read on your Instagram that unfortunately, your dog, Frank passed away unexpectedly last year. Yeah. And your post and actually makes me tear up a little bit is because you wrote that Frank was your wife's constant companion and support as she had a really challenging pregnancy. And you said we held pain and gratitude at the same time. And what I also really, really, really loved and deeply resonated with, we have made active efforts to move towards what's meaningful or those things that give us purpose. Can we talk a little bit about it and also how you feel about mm -hmm. Frank passing on? Yeah, yeah. so it was, uh, it was interesting. I've... So we, me and my wife, Elise, we, we kind of found Frank happenstance. There was like a sign on the side of the road that said like puppies for sale. I'm like, oh, we'll just go look. Well, you never just go look at puppies for sale. You, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a dangerous thing to do because you're going to wind up going home with one. So we did and we brought Frank home and um, he was a pretty cool part of our family, a really fundamental role because we didn't have any kids at the time. And so he kind of, in a way, became, you know, the child role in the family in a way. And my wife had a really terrible pregnancy, really hard, always, always sick, always in bed. And Frank was just always there with her. And because of that, there was quite a bit of emotional attachment. There was, you know, a support role that he took on in the family and, and, um, and he, you know, I won't get to the details of it, but really unexpectedly passed away. Still a mystery as to what was wrong. Um, but he uh, only, you know, about a year old was was gone. And it was really devastating. But we also learned so much through that time. I remember that we we just felt really grateful for the important parts of life. Like we were grateful for him. We were grateful for the memories. And we would talk about, you know, the how important he was to us and the fun things or the funny things that he did. And, and just kind of reflecting on how grateful we were um, to have him for the time that we did, while at the same time feeling all the pain that we lost him. And I think the gratitude made the pain bearable. Mm -hmm. And really the gratitude informed the pain, like it explained it, it helped us to really get a handle on, of course, this hurts so much, because look at how grateful we are for our time with him and for our experiences and for how much we love him. It's like, yeah, that gratitude informs the pain, gives, gives meaning to it. And also with that, we just started to turn towards the things that are truly meaningful. You know, when you are in the depths of sorrow, when something really deeply important to you is taken away, you have to turn towards those things that cannot be taken away that are also deeply important. For us, that looks like turning to God, uh, turning towards each other, our relationship, like the stuff that's still there that gives life meaning and purpose and helps remind you that you know, it's not that we want to try to forget about Frank and be happy all of a sudden. It's not that at all. It's that we also want to remember that there is still hope in the face of grief and loss. And that's what turning towards what's meaningful, what's purposeful 
does when a person is in a position of grieving, when a pers person is in a position of losing someone or something that's deeply important to them. Your words, I want to repeat them because I think it's important to repeat them because they're just so soothing and comforting is gratitude makes the pain bearable. Mm. And I think what you also said, you know, lean, like you, you were focusing on God and turning to your wife and thinking about the memories. I think also when we turn to God, it's, it's an act of gratitude. Yeah. And also when we turn to our partners, it's an act of gratitude. So it all comes down to gratitude and to gr to be grateful for what is. Yeah. And what what has helped me very much with grief, especially when my grandmother passed away, is having the gratitude that there is a lot that I need to say despite there being a lot that I need to say goodbye to, you know, her physical appearance, like never getting a birthday card again from her or not having her around on Christmas and, you know, all these things, there's okay. something I never have to say goodbye to. And this is our love, the love mm -hmm. we have for each other, have for each other and our bond. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I deeply resonate with what you said is focusing on what is there and something that's not going away and because it also gives us stability and that also the deeper understanding and feeling we are able to carry our hearts when they get heavy yeah 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 um yeah and, it, and it's and it's it's interesting because there's a part of us that wants to feel better in those situations, but there's also a part of us that knows that we can't just let go of it. Like it mm -hmm. almost is a disservice to how much we care about the person or the animal or whatever we have lost. And, and it's almost a foreign concept to some people. It sounds really simple when we hear it, but some sometimes it can be this big revelation where you can hold two feelings at once. Mm -hmm. Like you can feel that grief, you can feel that pain. You can feel angry at your partner. You can also feel that you really love them. And then you can also choose to lean into and heighten the feeling that you want to heighten and to bring up. You know, for example, oftentimes I'll be in therapy with couples and one partner will turn to the other and, you know, for the first time, maybe in a long time, kind of reflect with a lot of vulnerability and compassion, their partner's experience. Like, oh my gosh, this is how you feel. And you've been seeing it this way the whole time. And you've been afraid and you've felt the sadness and I, and I haven't been aware of it, but I'm seeing you now and I get it. And in that moment, the partner who's receiving it will often have two feelings at once. One will be like, oh, this feels so good. I feel seen. And one will be like, why the heck haven't you seen this before? I'm angry that it had to take this long. And so in that moment, I kind of help them navigate it. I can honor the anger and say, yeah, of course you're feeling that anger. But which feeling do you want to heighten right now? Like what's going to help the two of you move forward? And they say, well, I think that feeling seen. I'm like, okay, you know, so like tell me about feeling seen. Let's heighten that one. And sometimes heightening the emotion that you want or this feels more helpful is just talking about it. It's just noticing, sharing it with another person, you know, kind of, camping out over there and then we can come back to the anger like i think the anger is still important let's talk about it um but maybe in this case it feels more effective to lead with that feeling of being seen and being loved how good is that what you just said <laughs> it's just you know i think a lot of people have this confusion when they feel sad and happy and like um fearful and excited and you know, like they always feel it's, it's an opposite. It's either or. And I, I picture it as a rainbow. Mm. A rainbow also has different colors. And what yeah. makes the rainbow whole and also beautiful is the totality of its colors. Right. And that's the one thing. And the other, I love what you said. Okay, if you're feeling two emotions, which one right now do you want to heighten? Mm. Yeah. And that is golden. Uh, 
Absolutely. Like, yeah. It's a concept that I think really, a lot really, of good. really think about often is just being able to choose choose the emotion that you want to that you want to mm-hmm. lean into. Oh my God. I wish I could talk to you for hours because there's so much. And one thing I interviewing you reminds me so much of again. Your words are so golden and amazing. But I think what makes this interview the like extra precious is your energy. Mm. You are just so grounding and calming. Like I'm like, wow, like it's just I feel like after an hour of meditation and relaxation and yoga, it's just I must say any couple that has you as a therapist are just so, so lucky. And if yeah, I it's just so good. Trevor, <laughs> um, we always wrap up every episode with a little pet Q and A. So I want to ask you, if you could ask Frank a question right now, what would it be? This is a funny question. Um, maybe not one you would expect, but I think I think about this actually often because we'll kind of joke about like Frank being being with us at different mm-hmm. places. Like, you know, we're like skiing and like, he's like on the chairlift with us or like, he can be wherever he wants, you know? And like, we kind of joke about it. And um, I would just be like, what are you up to? Like, I'm kind of curious about the purpose of the soul of an animal after it leaves. Mm-hmm. Cause I believe that it's still around. It's like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, what's your, what's your purpose? Like, what does it look like for you? It's a bit more of a curious, curious question as far mm-hmm. as just what he's into. I I also agree um, that there there is a purpose in animals. I actually even believe some of them come back later on again. Yeah. And so it's a, such a beautiful way of asking them while they are transitioning and you know, waiting to come back down here. Hey, what are you yeah. up to? Yeah. I love yeah. that. It'd be, so, it'd be so fun to know. <laughs> so good. And what did he, and I'm sure the answer could be also really long, but the main thing, what did he teach you about love? Um, well, I think he probably taught us what all, well, a lot of dogs will teach you about love. It's just that like real unconditional consistency and yeah i think he i think in a lot of ways he taught me and prepared me uh to be a dad because i'm a dad now mm-hmm. um you know my son is six months old and um you know there's times when frank was super frustrating <laughs> some dogs can be especially puppies and mm-hmm. um not that i would like crazy on him or anything but i remember getting more more frustrated and a bit more maybe mean than i wanted to be as we can do sometimes. And I remember like after his passing, especially thinking, Hmm, I wish that wouldn't have happened. Like, I I think I would have liked to have been a little better in those situations. And, um, it kind of, I guess, shored up my commitment to be really, be really gentle and loving and consistent with my own son now. So that's, I think what Frank really taught me the most. I believe every we all have a purpose in each other's lives whether it's for a shorter or longer period and that's also one of the big reasons why this podcast is here because i believe animals can teach us so much and have a purpose in our life as much as we have in their life i was on a podcast and um on actually katie nurse wonger's podcast and she said her dog was there when she didn't have a child yet and he passed Mm -hmm. away when she was then a mother and we came to the conclusion then this podcast that probably her dog's purpose was there to prepare her to being a mother of a human child totally Mm -hmm. totally yeah absolutely and it yeah yeah. great great preparation and my very last question what is one of the many reasons that you're grateful for him oh man that's so 
that's big. Like I'm grateful. Um, I'm grateful that he gave me and my wife that opportunity to kind of learn how to care for another being together. I'm grateful that he was, um, like I was really, when he was around, I was super grateful that he was just like so active and so fun. Like he would go chase me on my mountain bike. Um, and he was just super committed to always just showing up. It was awesome. It, you know, even at times before I figured out how to make this not happen, we would go bike really hard and he would kind of rip up his paw. And I was like, oh man, that's not good. And he was, even when he was hurt, he'd be like jumping up to go with me. And I'm like, no, you got to stay home this time, man. But yeah, just really grateful. Yeah. For the spirit that he brought into our lives and our mm-hmm. home and, and for like the memory of him now. I'm really grateful for that. I'm pretty sure Frank is watching right now and is like, oh, dad, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Trevor, I also want to thank you. Um, It was such a pleasure talking to you. And I'm sure our Purple Stars family will absolutely love this episode. And also following you on social media and diving into your gifts in whatever way it is because i think life is all about connection and it our quality of life depends on how much we are willing to be connected and how much we feel connected whether it's with ourselves with god with partners with our purpose and I'm very grateful that you and I together made sure in this episode that we contribute to people feeling more connected. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a great rest of your day. Thank you. It's a wrap for today, everyone. If you loved this episode, please share it with your family, with your friends, with your partners, probably even better. And make sure you tag both Trevor and us to keep the conversation going. Send us DMs if you have any questions and we see you next Wednesday.